Welcome back, everyone. Today we are talking about indeterminate structures and calculating their reactions using the force method. Now, the whole idea behind an indeterminate structure is that you have more unknowns than you have equations of equilibrium. So if we take this structure, for example, I have three reaction forces, but I only have two useful equations of equilibrium, and that is the sum of moments about some point and my sum of forces in the y direction. So two equations, three unknowns, I need one more equation, otherwise I can't solve that. So the force method steps in and provides us with an extra, what we call constraint equation to solve for that third unknown. Now the constraint equation is that at each of the boundaries, I know what my displacement is. So in this case, I have a displacement of zero at all of my boundaries. So if we take one of those boundaries and we remove it, so let's take this one out and replace it. We'll find that, of course, it will deflect down now that I have removed that boundary. Now, the reaction force is, of course, going to try to lift that up. And if I can lift that up with a force that brings me back to zero displacement, the force that I'm applying here is equal to the reaction force of that support. And that's the whole concept of the force method. We can take a structure that's indeterminate. We can start removing boundaries or other constraints until we have a determinate structure. And then we apply constraints and solving for the, each of those constraints, I can find the reaction at any location, ensuring that the displacement at that point is equal to zero. So now let's take the concept of this force method and apply it to a few example problems. So we'll start by looking at the model that I just built, where it's about two foot for each span and has a distributed load of 0.05 pounds per foot. I have no idea what the modulus and moment of inertia are for this particular section, but it turns out we don't need to know that as long as it's constant along the section. So we'll assume that this is constant along the entire length. And I need to take this system and I need to convert it into a determinate system by removing one of my supports. So I will choose to remove support B and then I'll apply the constraint such that my displacement at B is equal to zero. So here's my determinate system now that my support at B has been removed. I have both the real load system and I have some unit load system located at B. And I don't know what this quantity here is for my reaction force, but that's what I want to solve. So for now, let's just leave that as a unit load. And I can look at the displaced shape both under the real applied loads and under this unit load. So under the real applied loads, my displacement at B is going to be delta B slash R, where the slash R is standing for my real applied loads in this case. And then I can also look at my displacement at B due to this unit load, and we'll call that the flexibility. So it's the flexibility at location B due to a unit load at location B. So the constraint equation states that my displacement at B better be equal to zero. And so if I combine these two, I have a displacement at B due to the applied loads, plus my reaction force at B multiplied by the flexibility at B due to a unit load at B that has to be equal to zero. Now we can go ahead and find those two displacements. We can use, for example, the principle of virtual work, which is quite convenient because you already have a unit load system and your real system here. But in this case, we just have a simply supported beam with either a distributed load or a point load at mid span. So we can just look up these displacements in a table and speed things along. So if I do that, I'll find that my displacement due to the distributed load is equal to a negative where the negative stands for downward displacement. 5WL to the fourth divided by 384 EI. Now plugging in the values for W, which is 0 0.05 pounds per foot, and my total length, which is four feet long, I can find that this quantity is negative 0 0.167 pound feet cubed divided by EI. Next, I can do the same thing for my flexibility. And if I look that up in a table, I'll find this is equal to P times L cubed divided by 48 EI. It's positive because it's upward. Applying my values, P in this case is one, it's just the unit load. And in fact, it's unit -less. So I'm gonna end up with units of just feet cubed. Length once, once again is four feet. So I'll find that this is 1.333 feet cubed divided by EI. And we can substitute those two values into my constraint equation. So therefore, negative 0 0.167 pound feet cubed divided by EI 
plus my reaction force RB multiplied by 1.333 feet cubed divided by EI. That all has to be equal to zero. Now I can see my EI cancels. It's constant along the whole length. The feet cubed are going to cancel, and I'll see that my result for my force is just going to be in pounds. So solving that equation for reaction at B, we'll find this is 0 0.125 pounds. Now that I've satisfied my constraint equation, now I can apply equations of equilibrium to find my remaining reactions. So for example, now that I know that this is 0 0.125 pounds, I can just take a sum of moments about A equal to zero to find my reaction at C, which is 0 0.0375 pounds. And a sum of forces in the Y direction equals zero tells me that RA is also equal to 0 0.0375 pounds. So therefore I've solved all my reaction forces if I then wanted to proceed with my shear and moment diagrams, that would proceed in the exact same way as we've done for determinate structures. So again, shear follows the load, moment is going to be the area under the shear diagram, and it's totally identical, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with determinate or indeterminate systems. So now that we've done a system with degree of indeterminacy of one, let's look how this scales up and look at a system with degree of indeterminacy of two. In this case, to increase my degree of indeterminacy by one, I've just taken point A and change that from a pin to a fixed N. So now I have an additional unknown, which is my moment here at A. Our degree of indeterminacy is therefore now two. So I'm going to have to remove two boundaries and apply two constraint equations to solve for my system. Now in this case, I like the idea of dealing with just a cantilever. So I'm going to remove B and C because when we have just a cantilever, I can look up these displacements in a table pretty easily. So here are my resulting systems. I'm gonna have three systems now that I have to look at. So this is my real applied loads. I'm gonna have a unit load at B and I'm also going to have a unit load at C. I'm gonna apply those each independently and I'm gonna find the displacement of my system under each of those cases independently. So I'm actually gonna to have to calculate six displacements here. For the real applied loads, I'm gonna calculate my displacement at B and my displacement at C. And similarly for my unit load at B, I'm going to find a flexibility at B due to the load at B and a flexibility at C due to the load at B. And likewise for my load at position C, I'll have a flexibility at B due to load at C and a flexibility at C due to load at C. Now combining all three of these together, all three are gonna have to add up to zero at point B, and all three are gonna have to add up to zero at point C. So applying constraint equations, displacement at B is going to be the displacement at B due to the applied loads, plus reaction at B times flexibility B slash B, plus reaction at C due to flexibility B slash C is all equal to zero. Moving on to my constraint at C, I see that I have a real displacement due to the applied loads at C, plus reaction at B, flexibility C slash B, plus the reaction at C, flexibility C slash C is equal to zero. So now I can see I have two equations and two unknowns. So each of those displacements and flexibilities I can calculate, that's just for a determined system. And my two unknowns are the reactions RB and RC. So I'm gonna solve a system of two equations to solve for these. So let's go forth and find all of our displacements. So my displacement at B due to the applied loads is going to be negative 51 divided by 1152 times WL to the fourth over EI. Evaluating that, we'll find that this is negative 0.566 divided by EI. And that'll have units of pound feet cubed, but I'll just leave the units off for brevity here. And I can calculate my displacement at C due to the applied load, it's negative WL to the fourth divided by eight EI, and this is going to be equal to negative 1.6 over EI. Moving on to the flexibilities, I can calculate my flexibility of B slash B, which is the displacement at B due to the unit load at B, and this is equal to L cubed divided by 24 EI, and evaluating that it's 2.667 divided by EI. Flexibility of C slash B is equal to 5L cubed divided by 48 EI. 
and that's going to be 6.667 divided by EI. Next, moving to my unit load applied at C, I can calculate my last two flexibilities here. So the flexibility of B slash C is also equal to 5L cubed over 48 EI. And that is of course 6.667 over EI. That is in fact the same as my flexibility at C due to the unit load at B. And that will always happen. This is a property of linear structures called Betty's Law, where your flexibility doesn't really matter where you're looking at for your displacement or your force. They're always symmetric in this way. So if you switch the location of the force and the location of the where you're looking at displacement, you'll get the same result. Lastly, I can calculate FC slash C, and this is going to be equal to L cubed divided by three EI. And this is equal to 21.33 divided by EI. So now I can substitute all these results into my constraint equations. These first three are all going to be placed into my constraint equation at B. So that states that negative 0 0.566 plus 2.667 times reaction B plus 6.667 times reaction C is equal to zero. And my second constraint equation is going to use all three of these quantities at location C. So I'll find that this is negative 1.6 plus 6.667 times reaction at B plus 21.33 times reaction at C is equal to zero. And solving those two equations and those two unknowns, we'll find that reaction at B is equal to 0 0.1143 pounds and reaction at C is equal to 0 0.0393 pounds. So now that I've satisfied my constraints, we can go ahead and apply equilibrium some moments about A is going to give me my reaction moment at A, which is going to be a 0 0.0143 with units of pound feet. It is in fact acting counterclockwise because it's positive. And lastly, my sum of forces in the Y direction will give me my reaction force at A, and that is equal to a 0 0.0464 pounds. So therefore I have solved for all four of my reactions. And again, finding shear and moment diagrams can proceed in the same way. And that is it for the force method. So just to summarize, the force method, we can take any indeterminate structure and start removing supports until it becomes determinate. But by removing those supports, we allow displacement. And so therefore we must apply loads at those locations to satisfy the constraints and bring those displacements back up to zero. So as always, I hope you learned something. Please subscribe and I will see you next time.